There's a pretty one, Ulysses. This is a particular d- delight to welcome Sharon back. She was on my debut episode many weeks ago, and here she is back. Sharon from Ohio, formerly of Sharon Goforth, the sadly uh, inactive booktube channel. Sharon, welcome back. Thank you so much, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so I'm excited to, to talk about this book. Yeah. So Sharon recently finished and absolutely loved the latest John McGregor novel, Lean Fall Stand, which let's see, it came out uh, just in September, somewhere yeah. in the world. It may have come out in other places in the world before that, but well, my Goodreads says September. And uh, John McGregor is a, a British author and most well-known, I think, for... Um, What's the other one? What's the most lean for? Reservoir 13. Reservoir 13, not Reservoir Dogs. I almost said that. That's a, that's a whole other d- different kettle of fish. So tell us <laughs> about this book. It sounds very intriguing, Sharon. Oh, it's very good. And here's here's a picture of the cover so you can see it. Right. Um, John Gregor is really good at what he does is he will have an incident at the beginning. And he works outward from that incident. So the incident becomes less and less important and what happens to the people who are involved in the incident becomes of great importance in in the book. So here we have, there's a party that is, he doesn't tell you where they are, but it's pretty obvious when you read the first few sentences that they're in Antarctica and they are, in a bad spot. If you don't mind, can I read you just the, the very beginning oh, of please. the book, Sean? Sure. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it will help put things into context and then mm-hmm. you'll see what I mean. This is from chapter one. It's divided into three sections. There's lean, fall, and stand. And those terms dictate how the story is told in each section, as well as having various meanings within what happens to these people within, within those sections. So the very first page, it says, when the storm came in, it was unexpected and Thomas Myers was dropped to his knees. The air darkened in the distance. There was a roar and everything went white against him. It had a kind of violence he wasn't prepared for. He wrapped his arms around his head and lay flat on the ice to keep from being hurled away. His hand twitched instinctively toward the phone, his phone, although he knew there was no signal and his phone wasn't there. His clothes felt as though they were being torn from his body, the air sucked from his lungs. He had heard this described as like being inside a jet engine, as though people knew what being inside a jet engine was like. People said these things, but the words didn't always fit. So, there's your first clue as to what the crux is of this book. And it's all about communication, right. miscommunication, no communication. And from there, it evolves into relationships. You know, what is a marriage? What makes a marriage? What happens when you're unable to communicate? What happens when people don't listen to you when you try to communicate? He explores all these things through this book, and it's just wonderful. His use of language is pretty astounding. It's kind of hard to describe because I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but on the other hand, you need to know these things in order to understand what the book is about. Hey, this is Editing Sean. Just a note about spoilers. Sharon and I had a long offline conversation about what would count as a spoiler, And the synopsis of this book does not mention anything about what actually happens in the story. We decided that it was okay to mention the central incident, which occurs in the first few pages of the novel, but doesn't become clear exactly what it is until a little bit later in the first section. And that decision may not work for you, in which case you should stop watching this entire bite-sized chat about this novel, because we do disclose what the central happening is. Is it a spoiler to say that he had a stroke? 
Well, it's it's a main part of the book, so I don't but know that it, that it is a spoiler. Yeah. It's a huge part of it. What he has is what they call aphasia. I think what you need to know, first of all, is that there, there were actually three people out there okay. in Antarctica. So one of them was the fellow that was talked about the, in the very beginning. They call, he called them researchers in geographic information services. So it's kind of GPS guys. Right. And they were doing research. And the guy that had the stroke, he referred to himself as a general technical assistant, but he had been going out with people um, doing this research for over 30 years. He was the experienced guy and he winds up having a stroke. Okay. That's what he has. This is a hard book to describe yeah. to talk about because everything is contingent on knowing these things what what it is is he has a stroke he doesn't realize he's having a stroke he thinks he's fine but he doesn't understand why he can't say words properly why he's thinking of things and it's this word play and i don't mean that in a funny way but right. it's this word play that is so brilliant in this book is how he conveys that without ever saying he's had a stroke. You know that because of what he's describing right. um, and the thoughts going through his mind, mm -hmm. but he never comes out and say it, says that until the second section, which is fall. And then it's obviously he's, his condition is serious, very serious. We're introduced to his wife, Anna, and she is a very big part of this. And their marriage had been, because he would go on these expeditions um, he'd be gone for months at a time. So he was hardly ever at home. They really didn't have a traditional marriage. They had, he had his thing with these expeditions and she had hers with her work and it allowed her, so she thought time to, to focus on her work and get her doctorate and all these things. The second chapter or the second section is told from her, her perspective. What she is seeing, you know, finding out that he's had this stroke. Mm -hmm. And again, the miscommunication, they think she knows things and she doesn't, you know, the doctors and the, and the people at the, in, the Institute is who he works for. It's just her story of how she's feeling, her reactions, because you see with him, he has, you get this loss of ind independence. Not only does he lose his independence through his speech and he can't, He's paralyzed or somewhat paralyzed on one side. Um, she loses hers as well. All of a sudden, she's the caregiver. Part three is when he starts, he joins a therapy group. And then you start hearing of other people with different circumstances right. and how they're having to deal with it. The therapists in this group give them a way to express themselves and share their stories and understand that they can still do that, even though it's in a completely different way than they did before. Yeah. Wow. So it starts out with a very dramatic incident. And then it sounds like it kind of, it's a, in a way quiet and very in an internal kind of character driven novel from there on in. Would that be fair? Um, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you have read others of McGregor's, which I have not, so. Well, I read Reservoir 13. I know it was long listed for the Booker yeah. Prize. It was fabulous. Yeah. Um, in fact, after I read this book, I went back and bought his backlist. That speaks volumes. <laughs> you gave it five stars, so I, I, I mm -hmm. think I know the answer to this question. Was there anything you didn't? <laughs> Was there anything you didn't like about it? Um, I felt that the third section, if there was a weakness anywhere, it was in that third section. Okay. Um, just, you know, it didn't quite have the impact that the first two sections did. Although it, at the end, it brought itself back. So, okay. no. yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to giving it a try. Do you suggest that I start with Reservoir 13 and then move on to this one or it doesn't matter? Um, I would. I would read it first. That gives you a, a feeling for his style. Um, and, then, and then this will make more sense. But I will, I will tell you this, Sean. When I was going back through looking at this to prepare for our chat, I found myself just reading it again. I mean, you know, I was looking for just like little sentences and quips and things. And, and I just got caught up in the whole story again so mean false stand by john mcgregor uh it's gone higher on my list thanks to you sharon and i want you to come back great 
I would love to. It gives me great pleasure to introduce for his first appearance on Bite Size Book Chats, a Instagram Goodreads friend of mine, Bernie from Jersey City. Welcome, Bernie. Hey, Sean. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. And I didn't do a whole lot of research on the book that we're going to talk about until about five minutes ago. And now I'm that much more excited to talk to you about it. But um, do we have an origin story? I think I just found you. I found you on Instagram because you were doing fabulous Booker stuff. Yeah. And we have I've just... been watching your videos for a long time. Oh, you have? Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Okay. <laughs> I didn't and know then I, I and then when I saw your video with Bob uh, on the promise, I, I'm obsessed with Damon Galgut and the promise. So when I saw that, I I was like, I need to find you on Instagram. So oh, so did you find me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so. okay. No, I just I didn't know that. Well, that's that I'm I'm blushing, especially because you saw us both talk about the fact that uh, there was no mention of Nelson Mandela in the novel. <laughs> I got like 17 comments. Yes, there was. So anyway, but it was a, it was a fabulous conversation Bob and I had, and uh, you and I have already high-fived each other that The Promise won yesterday. Yes, that was delightful. Correct. I didn't realize that the novel that you wanted to talk about was from Trinidad, and now I know that it is, and it just sounds fascinating. It's called The Dragon Can't Dance by Earl Lovelace, originally published in 1979, and you have just recently reread it. Tell us why you like this book. I really like books that are set locally. Um, you know, like in a very local community with like a wide, very vibrant range of characters that all add to the plot um, equally. I don't like books that have a main character and then like random character perspectives are like thrown in, you know, like maybe for like one chapter here or there. It's one of the issues I had with Chuggy Bane, just like a pet peeve of mine. I mean, I understand why other people like it and why other people find it useful. But anyway, this book doesn't do that. This book is set in a a slum in Port of Spain in Trinidad. There are a bunch of different characters who are all different, but they're all kind of coping with the impact of colonialism on their psyche, kind of negotiating their sense of fatalism and um, idleness and laziness. And then with this like desire to be seen and to have, have a voice. And the plot follows all of these characters getting ready for carnival um in trinidad and that's like very much their opportunity to make themselves seen so they're all um working on their costumes especially this one character who's kind of what like kind of the main character but not exactly like i said they're all the characters are equally and you can see my dog moving around over there oh, awesome awesome um, <laughs> <laughs> that character who is the dragon who does um dress up like the dragon uh -huh. um he, he starts to realize maybe like a third through the narrative that what they're doing is investing so much of their energy into this performance that takes place, you know, for less than a week each year. And then throughout the rest of the year, they don't really have a purpose. And so all these characters are like, are, are dealing with this idea in one way or, or the other. Strikes me that it's, interestingly ironic that you've what did you say what was the phrase did you say they found their sense of identity through the carnival express their true selves i think Ex something well, like they that ex they express their selves that they want to be seen right and are they not all masked during carnival they are all masked so, yes. so that strikes me as very interesting yes that's yeah oh no that's totally the point um, yeah. <laughs> that, that they're depending on these sur surface level um, representations of themselves they're all also fascinated with the american film industry hmm. and so there's this whole idea of everything they do is like a performance and i feel like lovelace weaves in that influence to work through um, you know even though they're a post-colonial society we now have you know american cultural imperialism that's impacting all of their experiences yeah the mask gives them power that okay. they don't have in their in their day to day lives. So like the dragon, he elicits fear just on that day. And it gives him a, it gives him this sense of like of power that he doesn't have throughout the rest of the year. There's also and I feel like you would find this interesting based on what I know from um, watching your videos is that there's this character, Sylvia, who's at like 
kind of at the heart of the book that um, is consistently there throughout, who is a 16-year-old girl in the beginning, but the the book moves um, over the course of several years. Um, She's very young. In the beginning, she doesn't have a costume. Her mother is poor, and she kind of has to, like, do things to help her family out. Like, she sucks up to the the light-skinned beauty who's thought of like the queen of their little community uh, who has money and you know it's obvious there's like a hierarchy there part of their coping with their circumstance as a post-colonial society is like dealing with this idea that everybody's one um everybody's equal but it's like so not true and this light-skinned lady who has a lot of money her house is positioned in the community she's able to look down at everybody else so most of the main characters are men except for sylvia and the queen miss cleotilda that's her name they kind of deflect throughout the entire book they're seeking a sense of purpose onto her they use her as almost a way to ignore their lack of self-awareness on her so like they're all concerned throughout the entire book with the fact that she didn't have a costume or that she needs a man to take care of her then at the end Lovelace does something interesting that I'm not gonna reveal to spoil Mm -hmm. but like it's through her that things start to they start to realize their issues the things they're doing wrong Port of Spain and then I believe there's this specifically within that city it's the shantytown calvary hill yes tell us about a little bit more about calvary hill the setting sure so it's a it's a slum and it's where they all live and he refers to the yard a lot so this space where kind of there the a few of the characters homes all open up into and where miss cleotilda is like perched above everybody else that's one of the great things about Lovelace as, as a writer. He really brings you into this deeply rich community. And I don't know about, I don't know beautiful is the right word, but like, it just has a lot of vibrancy. Colorful. Um, and... Yeah, it's very colorful. Yeah. It's very active. You know, there's people coming in and out. Everything revolves around preparing for carnival. Fascinating. Well, I am totally sold. I had never heard of Earl Lovelace. I'd certainly never heard of this novel and I can't wait to read it. Please come back and chat about uh, as many books as you'd like on my channel. Okay, I will. Thank Thank you you. so much, Bernie. Yes, of course. I am delighted to welcome Annie from Adelaide, Australia. Welcome to Bite Size Book Chats, Annie. Thanks. Lovely to be here. Annie is one of the fabulous AAA co-hosts of Books on the Go with Anna Bailey Karras, who is a booktuber, and Amanda. Uh, Why don't you give us a little bit of an elevator pitch for Books on the Go, Annie? Well, Books on the Go is a podcast where we talk about, we read um, one book a week and we discuss the book that we've read. um, And we also talk about a little bit of news. We try and keep them pretty short. They're usually about 15 or 20 minute episodes. We have been going for almost three years now, which is an amazing amount of time now that you look back on it. It's really fun to do. We keep it pretty light. We don't do any spoilers. Good for book clubs and people who are looking for new reads. I will add to that because I think that was far too modest that it is one of the best book podcasts out there And because I'm not a big book podcast consumer and I I rarely miss an episode and Uh I love the vibe between the hosts. Hosts revolves through there's always only two hosts at once, right? Mm -hmm. But they both read the same book when it's focused on a book and sometimes agree, but uh, disagree on certain things, but agree that overall it was crap or that it was wonderful. (laughs) But sometimes yeah. sharply disagree and there's no there's no sparks <laughs> or anything, but it's just really intelligent and entertaining. I don't know how you fabulous people do it because it is just a, a delight. Thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> so here, here you are to bring some of that verve and uh, oh, yeah, panache exactly. to, to my series. I'm sorely <laughs> lacking in that department. We are here to talk about what you have said is one of your favorite books that you've read this year. Is it your favorite book you've read this year? I don't think so, but it's probably my favourite Australian book that I've read this year. But I've read quite a few really good Australian books and um, more international books as well. So it's going to be really tough trying to pick my top 10 for the year, which I have to do shortly, but this will probably be on it. Awesome. It is called Bodies of Light by Jennifer Down, and it just was published in September. Yes, it was. So I got an advanced copy from Text Publishing, who are the publisher. Um, So I read it back in 
maybe July or August. And I believe this one is quite a challenge to talk about. So good luck and let's go. Sure. Tell us about it. Well, so it follows a woman called Maggie, basically from birth through until we meet her um, in her 60s. So we meet her in 2018. She's living in Burlington in Vermont and she receives an email from someone from her past and they say, look, I think that you might be this woman that I knew when we were in foster care together and she is totally sent into this spiral because she, Maggie, that she um, grew up as is now living as Holly. She has totally pushed aside her previous life and so then we flash back right to the very beginning of her life in the 70s. She's born in 1973 and she's born into a really awful situation, really. Her parents are both drug users. Her mum dies really early on. Her dad he loves her and is, um, tries his best, but he's put in prison when she's six, and so she's put into foster care. And then she's shunted around between various care homes for various reasons. She doesn't necessarily get on with the family or they don't get on with her. She really is a, a product of the system. So I should really preface the book by saying, it's a book that deals with a lot of heavy themes and there's probably some content warnings that readers might want to take note of, including but not necessarily limited to child abuse, sexual assault, infant death and drug abuse. So, yeah, Maggie really has it tough, but she does make it through to year 12, which is kind of our matriculation uh -huh. year. She ends up in a, a reasonably good home with a woman who cares for her and loves her in a pretty tough love kind of way. And that sees her through year 12. But it's the kind of book where every time she gets back on her feet and she really does, you know, she, she tries really hard. She does all the right things. She makes a new life for herself. And then another thing will just sideswipe her, whether it be illness or um, some other circumstance that just totally pulls the rug out from under her feet. And so the book then is a, is a book of reinvention. She has maybe six or seven different, not quite personas, but lives that she lives during this book. And it's a really incredible testament to both the writing of Down and this character that she's created, that they can be so resilient and push through some of the hardest things that anyone would have to live with in any life. And just the confluence of all of these events happening in one life really makes you feel for this character. But I think what I loved about it is it's, it's so clearly seen. It reminded me a lot of Elena Ferrante or Helen Garner, who's an amazing Australian writer who really looks very unflinchingly at the hardest things in life. And it's not that there's no sympathy, but there's no... Sentimentality? Yeah, yeah. It's not sentimental at all and it's not judgmental at all either. Mm. Maggie makes some bad choices and does contribute to her own downfall several times, but you can see where that's come from as well because you've got her whole history there of, well... How would you react if you had lived through all of that? So I think you have an immense amount of um, love for her and you really want the best for her in all of these scenarios. It's a really incredible book. It'll stay with me forever, I think. Now, it's, that was a daunting list of content warnings that you gave me, but that the, the more that I'm listening to you describe the book, it does not at all sound like trauma porn. No, not at all. No, no, no. It doesn't wallow. In. It really honours someone who's lived that kind of life. And I think that there will be lots of people for whom this will be way too much. And I, it's not a book I would recommend to everyone. Right. And especially if you uh, were in a vulnerable place in your own life, I think this would be a really difficult book to read, but also perhaps a really reassuring book to read because it kind of has this message at its heart that you will make it through mm -hmm. and maybe the next version of you won't be the same, but you'll be there. So, yeah. Did you say she got this Facebook message when she was 60? In her 60s. I can't In her 60s. Her. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, the, the page count makes sense then because it's, mm. it's a chunker, 450 pages or something. Yeah. Yeah. But it really, it's an easy read. I mean, I breezed through it until there's one section in the middle where it's the kind of book where you kind of have to put it down and sit with it for a bit mm. and then come back to it. Um, but the, the the writing just flows. All of the segments are pretty short and you kind of keep coming back to Holly in the 2018 sections of the book as she's trying to process whether to contact this person and admit that they, are, mm. they were in the same care home. Because you're kind of anchored in each segment of her life, both the present and the past, and each informs each other as well. It does feel like there's a mystery kind of unraveling. And you know from the start some of the information that I've already said because she has described that in her older um, age. 
but you get the real detail of it and the emotional depth in the periods that plunge you right back into her early life and her, yeah, the experiences that she's lived. It sounds incredible. What can you tell us about the author? Well, Jennifer Down is intimidatingly young. I think she's in her early 30s. And this is her third book that she's published in Australia. So I read her first book, which was called Our Magic Hour, which also deals with heavy themes. Um, It's about the suicide of a friend. It's really Australian writing, I think. So that takes place in Melbourne, as does this for parts of it. And it's got a real lightness of touch and, again, a real empathy for the characters. So I was blown away by her debut novel. And then she released a series of short stories called Pulse Points the year later. So she obviously had those waiting around. Well, you've totally sold it to a bunch of non-Australians, including me. I have no idea how easy it is to find, but (laughs) this is great, Annie. I hope you'll come back someday. Yes, I hope so too. I am really excited to welcome Chitra to my channel. Chitra is originally from the Manipal state in India, and she now lives in Delhi. Chitra, welcome to my channel. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Lovely to be here. And you have recently read and loved, I believe that you would agree with that verb, loved, a collection of short stories from Bangladesh. It's called Taxi Walla and Other Stories, and the author is Numar Atif Chowdhury. Yes. Please tell us about this collection of short stories from Bangladesh. Bangladesh, as you know, is a relatively new nation. Uh, they, they were liberated from what is known as East Pakistan in 1971. And uh, a lot of writings from Bangladesh, if you look at it, uh, basically in Bengali, which is known as Bangla. Numer Atif Chaudhary uh, belongs to that new age of contemporary, or rather, unfortunately, I would say belonged, because he passed away in a tragic incident in uh, Japan, when he had just submitted the final draft of his first and only book called uh, Babu Bangladesh. Uh, he happens to be one of the foremost writers uh, writing in English, but his ethos, uh, you know, the worldviews are universal. You know, a great writer is somebody whose worldviews are universal, but yet it is rooted in this world. So, what uh, Numer does in his stories are that it could be anywhere in South Asia, and especially in the Indian sub continent. So it talks about class, it talks about the struggles that went into the liberation of Bangladesh, it talks about uh, poverty, it talks about the lives of people that you hardly think about, you know, like a construction worker. And believe me, construction, the lives of construction workers in India and Asia are very different from, say, the lives of construction workers in the West. Mm. So, uh, he focuses on the lives of the people that you barely see you know, walking on the street and you look at them and you're like, okay, they are smelly and they look poor. But he looks at the humanness, uh, you know, the load that they carry and the people that they become. So uh, those uh, attributes make his story very powerful and it makes you, you know, kind of halt and step back and think and look where you are. So that's what I love about his stories. This could be set in any part of, say, uh, Pakistan or Bangladesh or India or Nepal or Sri Lanka, except for one story, which specifically in this collection, it talks about uh, the young people who were part of the liberation war. You know, so that one is specifically Bangladesh. And then, of course, the title story, because the taxiwala is about uh, this interaction between a a taxi wala and a tourist who comes from abroad and he's being taken around the city of Dhaka. So other, the rest of the stories could be anywhere in South Asia. Interesting. Sarah. Would you like to tell us about the title story? Taxi wala is a very interesting story. The title story, it's about a taxi driver. Uh, he waits at the airport in Dhaka, at the Dhaka airport terminal, and he's picking up uh, people from there. So he catches a foreign national. And there's this whole uh, interesting thing going on, you know, like when a Western person comes to Asia, there's always this notion that I'm going to be cheated. Right. So that is used as a a form where the taxi driver, he knows that it's expected that he would be cheating. He doesn't like that. 
but still he's taking him around in circles so that he's going to get a little bit of uh, money. So that stereotype is enforced in that, but he's aware that, you know, that is how other people perceive him, but he's still going to do it because he needs the money because, and then his circumstances unfold of why he has to do that. You know, the money that he has to pay to the union so that his vehicle can be one of the vehicles, uh, you know, uh, to ferry passengers. But there is a moral compass in that man, you know. We would think that, okay, if a, a taxi driver is going to cheat me of maybe a, a you know some amount of money he is going to be a person who wouldn't have any moral scruples but he has moral scruples for instance he's not going to be prepared to take uh, you know certain liberties that the men would want that the tourists would want in a third world country so there are certain things that he is not ready to do but there are things that he is going to do you know because of the condition that is there though so those nuances very, very interesting. That sounds so interesting. Um, <laughs> Lou, you alluded at the beginning of our talk, of our conversation, that he died tragically in, in Japan. So he was only 43, and he died just like three years ago in Kyoto. Yeah. He had just sold his novel. Yes. And he was yes. taking a walk along the riverside, and he fell yeah. in and drowned. Yes. The tragedy is that uh, it took him 15 years to work on his one and only novel, Babu Bangladesh. And I haven't yet read this book. I have had it for the past one and a half year, but I've been really scared to read this. Today, you know, when we were we had this uh, talk schedule, I was taking out this book from my shelf and I was reading the preface. And it struck me that he finished it in 2008 and it is set in the, for him, 2021 was the, was the future. So now we are in 2021. He's no longer there. And there is a, a part where the US president comes to visit Bangladesh in 2022. And the name is Tulsi Harris. So that link to that Kamala Harris thing is there. And I'm like, yeah, the, oh what God. was the name? Uh, it's Tulsi Harris. Okay, very interesting. So it's a fictional thing. But he saw it coming, you know. Yeah, okay. I'm getting goose flesh right now because uh, this book is, I've, I've read about this book, around this book so much. And that's why I got scared, you know. There's a lot of political allegory in this book. There's oh. a lot of uh, realism, uh, you know, elements. And it's about the political uh, journeys that Bangladesh has been taking over the past few decades. It took him 15 years to finalize the draft of this book. 15 years. In this 15 years, he could have written a lot, many of the books, but he focused his entire energy on this one whole book. And obviously his short stories were there, you know, in between, but he did not work on any other novel. And just as it was being, uh, you know, handed over, then he died in that tragic, tragic incident. Well, I'd like to probe a little bit more about you feeling scared. Are you scared you're not going to like it? No, it's just that, you know, I have this thing about, when you are, especially when you are reading a book that has got political allegories, you know, you, you feel a connect with the author, not just with the book, but with the author as well. And then you, I mean, I would say I, I would, you know, fall into what did we miss out because of his passing away? Oh, so it's because of kind the of fact a, that he's no longer alive. Yeah. Sure, it's kind of a sadness, even a grief yes, of our author yes. that's no I, longer. I know oh. it's very strange. It's very strange, but that's no, how you know. Yeah, it just it's something that is on my mind. But when the short stories came, I was like, okay, I have to read this because there, there are other books of uh, the, you know, there are other works of Nume that can be read. So. Well, I, I think whatever emotional issues. Uh, I might have to experience to read Taxi Walla. I'm going to deal with them because it sounds fabulous. Mm. I'm looking forward yes. to giving it a try. So, uh, Chitra, can I reserve a spot? If you end up liking his novel that you've been telling us about, will you come back and tell us about it? Oh, yes, definitely. I would love that. And regardless of whether it's that book or any other book, I'm looking forward to your second appearance. Thank you so much. Thank you.